Father in heaven, we're going right in. We've, we've in this church celebrated baptisms this morning. We've celebrated the dedication of a young missionary who will someday shine for you. This afternoon, we will, we will celebrate the life of Pat Graybill and the blessing that she was. Could it be on a Sabbath like this so full of significance that you do something deep and permanent in our hearts? Oh God, we're praying. Would you break our hearts and remake them? Send the third person of the Godhead to teach us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a crazy story. Cambyses, the prince of Persia. He was wreaking havoc. Gave Egypt a couple of black eyes. He's headed back. And he's camped out in the shadow of Mount Carmel. He's there after having done his work in Egypt in the south and he's moving back. He's there in the shadow of, of Mount Carmel at where, the, where the valley of Megiddo meets up. That's a word we will find out later in Revelation that John the Revelator says, that, that is what we're going to use to represent that final war, that final battle between good and evil. But there he is, the prince of Persia. Now, historians don't agree on what happens next. Either he accidentally stabbed himself with his own sword or he committed suicide, one of the two. But in the shadow of Mount Carmel, the prince of Persia dies. It's that story that God takes through the prophet Daniel in, in what is the most difficult prophetic chapter in Scripture, arguably, Daniel chapter 11, and he tells of the prince of Persia and how the prince of Persia will come to an end. It's in the, it's in the shadow of Mount Carmel, the same mountain that played out that drama between good and evil with the prophets of Baal and the prophet claiming to be the one true prophet of God. Elijah took the stand and prayed for fire to be rained down and for God to anoint his altar and show himself the God of heaven and earth. It's in the shadow of that mountain that the prince of Persia dies, literally, but God takes that story, that literal historical story, and says, by the way, that's how this thing plays out. In that valley of Megiddo, in the, in the shadow of Mount Carmel, there will be one great con final conflict, the Battle of Armageddon. And the prince who opposes himself against God, who opposes all that is right, will come to an end in that battle. That's... Daniel chapter 11. Now Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 serve as one final package of prophecy in the prophetic book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10 and 11, Daniel, like John the Revelator, receives a vision on a Sabbath day. John the Revelator ends up getting a, a vision on a Sabbath much later. Both of them in this vision see the person of Jesus. They both come to realize that there is a conflict, war over our lives. In Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel actually shows up to Daniel, says, Daniel, I want you to know, heaven is doing everything it can to defend you. It doesn't seem like it, but behind the scenes, behind what you can see here, heaven is doing whatever it can to defend you. That takes us to the final chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Got your Bibles? Good. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. This is our final teaching on this prophetic book. 
for now. We're coming back to it. Daniel chapter 12. For the next couple of weeks, we'll be blessed. Pastor Matt Hasty, our elders, Caleb John. And we'll be back running through March. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time. What time? We're talking about the time when, when this whole drama unfolding in, in Daniel chapter 11. This prince of Persia who's resisting God will come to an end at that time. When, when that happens, at that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Daniel does a little, a, a little grammatical, poetic statement here. The, the prince of the people will stand while he's been standing. So there's this, this kind of standing, uh, stepping forward kind of motion. He's been watching over his people, but at this time, he's going to step forward. It's a political move. It's a military move. It's a judicial move. There is something that happens at this moment when God says, enough. I've been watching this entire time. I've been, I've been controlling the ebb and flow of history. I've been standing for my people. But then he steps forward. This, this stepping forward is profound. It's significant. Now, the... Uh, the old preacher, the Advent preacher, Uriah Smith, says, hey, this, this is when he says, we're done with everything. This is a decisive moment in human history. It's sometime shortly before Jesus comes in that cloud. It's that moment that John the Revelator will finally tell us about later when Jesus says, there is no more. Those on this side will remain. <clears throat> Those on that side will remain. We're done with this. He steps forward and it's over. Now, what about this individual, Michael? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a new person. We, we are introduced to, to Michael in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. But even before that, Michael, this great prince, is the most important person the most important character in the entire narrative of Daniel. Oh, we've got Daniel in the lion's den. Yes, absolutely, three worthies. Oh, thank you very much. But be, in every one of those scenes comes this great prince. Wait, don't, he's not called Michael in all of those. No, 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 no. We're introduced to him in Daniel chapter 3 as the fourth man in the blazing furnace. We're introduced to him in Daniel chapter 7 as the son of man in the heavenly judgment. We're introduced to him in Daniel chapter 8 as the prince of the host who was cut off in the middle of the week in chapter 9 called the Messiah. In chapter 10, he's the man clothed in linen. All through the book of Daniel, he emerges with a different part to play. But he is constantly there, the most important character in this narrative and in our narrative is the great prince. He steps forward, one who is like God. And when he steps forward, the devil takes one final swipe on this planet. And let's read, what, what, is it, what does it say? The great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time, there will be a time of trouble, of distress, maybe your version reads, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Here, there's a political move. Satan moves across the nations to stir the world into turmoil. Now, again, referencing Uriah Smith and his commentary on the book of Daniel, and it includes the book of Revelation. He points out something I, ha I had not noticed. I would have read right over. He says, wait a minute. There's a time of trouble. What kind of trouble is it? It's a trouble for the nations. 
he actually goes so far as to disagree with other commentators and theologians who see the time of trouble such as never has been Jesus' reference in the New Testament in the book of Matthew as a different time of trouble completely. Uriah Smith points out this and says, no, 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 this isn't about the church. This is about the nations. This will be a political turmoil. Now, I don't know if Uriah Smith, about, or right, Uriah Smith is right about there being two separate times of trouble, one more spiritual and one more political, but he is spot on with this. The final turmoil, the final time of trouble on this planet will be stirred politically. Well, what do we know? But we have come into a time of political unrest, of turmoil, of trouble such as we have never known or our grandparents ever since there was a nation on this planet. We're not talking about the, the United States. We're talking about any time in history. The devil stirs up a political turmoil. Whoo! Why is that the focus? Is that the problem on this planet? Absolutely not. It's a facade. It's a fake. It's a distraction. All he wants is for the world to turn and say, look, we've just got to solve this political mess. Let's, let's come on. Let's come together and, and stop being so angry and violent with each other. It's all a facade. Behind the scenes, the devil is looking to distract us from the spiritual conflict, the final spiritual conflict on this planet. Beloved, do you think God wants the Republicans to win this thing? You are mistaken like none other. Oh, you think it's a, it's a Democrat move? If God can just have the Democrat? You think that solves the problem? Beloved, be not so foolish. This is not a question of red or blue. This is a question between the two unfolding dramas behind the scenes of right and wrong. The rest is a facade, but the final stress on this planet will be stirred per Daniel politically. Now, watch, watch his progression of thought. Michael stands up. Time of stress, a trouble such as never has been since there was a nation. What happens next? Keep reading. But at that time, at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. That was an intentional progression. Michael, the great prince that watches over his people, stands up. The devil says, I've got one more. He begins to stir the political pot. There's a time of distress and turmoil on this planet. But through that emerges a generation, a community of faith, who are refined and found written in the book of life. Did you catch the progression? The turmoil refines that community. It doesn't destroy it. It purifies them. It refines them. This trial, this stress, the very thing that pains us, that confuses us, that causes us distress could be the very thing that God uses to refine and purify us. Uh, my wife has been reading several of Bob Goff's book. And uh, on a plane ride earlier this, this winter, she, uh, she, she, she threw it over at me and said, hey, you got to read this. This is good. This is good. So I, I, I read through the book on that plane ride. It's an easy read, as you know, with Goff's work. He, he's, a, he's a lawyer, speaker, author, and he's a pilot. And, and so he's, he's, he has an appointment in a, in a particular place there in California, and he, instead of driving, renting a car and driving, he's, he decides to rent a plane. I guess that's a nice little thing if you, if you can do that. You go to the airport and you rent a plane. He rents this little plane. He says it was held together by tape. It was just a little jalopy, but it got him over to where he was supposed to go. He parks out in this, this airport where he's, this little airport where he's supposed to uh, go present or do his appointment, and uh, two F-16s pull up. Well, he looks back at the little plane he just crawled out of. He's in old jeans. He's got a Mickey Mouse watch on, according to him, and an old T-shirt, and he sees these two fighter pilots come out of their jets, parked just to the side of his little rent-a-plane. Rent -a and he says it was a little, it was a little, 
a little intimidating. So he strikes up a conversation trying to uh, kind of connect with, the, with these two warriors crawling out of their F-16s. He says, hey, uh, you know, uh, how'd you guys get, what, what flight, what route did you get to take to get here? So they told him that they flew over 2,000 miles to get to that, that airport. And, and the reason that they came there was to practice flying. Now, when Bob Goff flew there, he said he, he sat down, he mapped it out. He picked the safest, nicest, most pleasant route. But these fighter jet pilots said, no, 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 we didn't go, we didn't go over the mountains. We went through the mountains. Why would you go through the mountains? That's terribly dangerous. Yes, they said, because it's going through the mountains that makes us better. It's through those canyons and valleys that forces us to hone our skills and refines us and makes us better. Sometimes we'd like to fly over the mountains. No stress, no turmoil. Let's take it easy. Let's go the easy route. God, God says, I need to send you guys through the mountain. I need to send you through the valleys and through the canyons because that's what will make you better. So why can't we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the trials you brought on my life. It will refine me and it will make sure my name is in the book of life. Verse 2. This, is, this gets interesting. Verse 2, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Now, what happens next? Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Many of those who sleep in the dust, this is the new King James, of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Thank you very much. Beautiful passage on the resurrection. Matter of fact, the most powerful passage in the Old Testament. It is said that there is not a scholar of any persuasion, those who, who believe you go straight to hell or heaven, those who, who uh, believe in something else, and those who believe obviously in the rest in the grave, there is not a single scholar who has come up with an answer to this text. It's clear as the hand in front of our face, whoa, it clearly means you die, you go to the dust, and there will be a resurrection. But hang on. We would say, yeah, absolutely. There's a rest. When Jesus comes, those who have been waiting, Pat Graybill, our loved ones, will be resurrected to see Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. That's not what Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is talking about. There's a, there's a chronology here. Here, Michael, the prince, stands up. There's a time of trouble. There's this refining that happens. There's an, a resurrection at that time. Uriah Smith points this out. He says, read it again. What does it say? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Not all. This is not the general resurrection. In the general resurrection, we know there's two resurrections. The first resurrection is all of the righteous will be resurrected to, to meet the Lord in the air. And then a thousand years later, there will be a resurrection of all of the wicked. This isn't that resurrection. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, not all, many will awake and some of them will be for salvation and some of them won't. What happens when Michael, the great prince, stands up and says, this is over? I said so. It's so powerful. There's a resurrection. There's a special resurrection before Jesus comes. You say, well, why would there be? Well, why not? When that same great prince hung on the cross and cried, it is finished, there was a resurrection. And now, as he steps forward in heaven and cries out again, it is finished, there's another resurrection. Jesus made it very clear to a few fine folk that they would be resurrected to see him come in the clouds of heaven and it would be dishonor to them. I don't know who will be part of this resurrection, who the righteous will be, but there are some, maybe in the context of the great controversy, there are some who have played such an important role in the great controversy for the right that God will resurrect them and allow them to see the second coming unfold. And there will be some who played such an important part for the side of darkness 
that God says, I'm going to let you see. I'm going to let you see the final play of this controversy. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 says that there will be many when Michael stands up and cries out, it is finished, like he did on the cross, death will give some up. Hallelujah. Verse 4. We'll skip right over verse 3 for the sake of time. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And we read that in, in a general sense that to, the technology, oh, look, the, 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 the sciences and everything, knowledge is being increased. The Hebrew expression here uses a definite article, which means it's a definite knowledge that's increased. This knowledge it would say. The English is just so weak on this. This knowledge, not knowledge in general, but this knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of what verses 1 and 2 and 3, the prophetic word of God. Daniel is actually using a similar line that Amos, another prophet, used in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. I'll put it on the screen for you. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread, not a thirst for water. Don't get distracted with the physical world. No, but the hearing of the word of God. This is a spiritual question. Verse 12 in Amos chapter 8. Keep reading. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. The prophecy in Daniel is... You seal this up, Daniel, because there will come a final generation who will unseal this, and they will find it. And that's why, as we came into this teaching today, I said we may be ending our study on the book of Daniel for right now, but we cannot end it forever because this book, this prophetic word, is supposed to speak loud and clear in our generation. You think God's concerned about knowledge of facts and, and, and dates. Oh, I, I need people to know the timeline. No, no, no. It's not about the timeline. God, God knows that that's, that's helpful, but that is not the most important information from the book of Daniel. The most important information is that God wants to raise up a final generation before he comes. Those who will go through the time of distress and turmoil, but be found in the book of life. So what is God's word supposed to do? Let me just give you, I won't put it on the screen, but I'm gonna just read for you. First Peter chapter one, verse 23. You will be regenerated through what? Through the living, abiding word of God. That's what it does to us. God's word does inform our mind. It does give us facts and presentation. The prophetic word of God does outline players and dates and timelines, but that's not what the word of God was meant as its primary purpose. Well, you ask Paul in his letter to, to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.15, and you, ha, you have known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the purpose of Scripture, to make us wise unto salvation, to, to refine us, to regenerate us. The knowledge that will be increased at the very final generation is not one that has better dates or timelines, but one that has a more pure and faithful heart. Just like the primary or the secondary character, the primary character, just like Jesus, the primary character, but just like the secondary character of Daniel as well. I'm reading this last December the cold, dead winter morning, it's, it's dark, and I'm reading this in my study, and, and God takes this, these lines and grabs my hand and says, Michael, I, I, I need you. I need to talk to you about some stuff. Here's the lines. They're from Great Controversy. He who deliberately stifles his conviction... He who deliberately stifles his convictions of duty because it interferes with his inclinations. Ah, it's not, my, it's not my preference. It's not what I want to do. It's not what's comfortable for me. I'd rather not. He who stifles 
deliberately stifles his convictions because of his personal preferences, his inclinations, will finally lose the power to distinguish between truth and error. There will come a place, no matter how small or how big those items are, when I stifle my convictions because of my personal preferences, I will come to the place that I don't even know right from wrong. The understanding becomes darkened, the conscience callous, the heart hardened, and the soul is separated from God. Do you hear the cry of Daniel? Not for better timelines, those are helpful and important, but for a final generation who is faithful and loyal completely. Now this December, speaking of December, Melanie, bought me a gift certificate. It's not to Jack's or to Lowe's or to Shields like most normal people would do. She bought me a gift certificate to Mile High Skydiving Center in Longmont. No, I didn't, that's not exactly the proper response. It's not a who. I always thought I wanted to go until, until I got the certificate. So now I'm doing reading and watching YouTubes on this and making sure I'm emotionally and mentally prepared for this this occasion that will happen when it, obviously, when it gets warmer. I'm reading about this and one author says, hey, by the way, let me tell you about skydiving. Done it tons of times. There's one rule. When When you release that parachute, Your parachute, you have to check and make sure that there is not a single one of the strings holding the parachute to you that is wrapped around the parachute or is that over the top of the parachute. Not a single string. He said if there is one single string, you will appear to be falling normal, but when you get close to the ground, you will be unable to slow down. It will hurt. Maybe a little too much. Not a single string. What do you do if there's a a string over the top of your parachute? You cut the parachute off and use your secondary or your emergency parachute because it will appear normal, but you've got to know it is not. That one string will cost you your life. Wait a minute. If one string matters when you're skydiving, Could one string matter when you're living? It's life and death when you're skydiving. What do you think we're talking about here? We're talking about life and death. You thought it was who won the presidential election? You thought it's who has the majority in the house? No. We're talking about your life. Your eternity. After verse 4, there's one final prophecy that points forward to, to, to God making all things right and settling it. It points forward. It ends in 1844. It's a, that's a powerful date, not just by one prophecy, but by several. But at the end of that prophecy, Daniel chapter 12, that prophecy, God again turns to Daniel and he speaks to him directly. These, these, these should be red letters in our Bible. No, they're not because they're not in the New Testament, but these, these are, this is a quote. Verse 13. But you, Daniel, go your way to the, till the end, for you shall rest. We already know about that. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 says those that rest in the, in the dust, it's, it's right there. They'll sleep, rest in the dust. I wonder if, to myself, if that wasn't God's promise to Daniel that he would be part of the the special resurrection. He just told him, hey, Daniel, there's going to be a special resurrection. Some of of those who are resting in the grave. Oh, by the way, Daniel, you're going to have to rest. I just wonder. I I would have heard it that way if Jesus told me that. But he said, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise up to receive your allotted inheritance. You'll rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. By the way, you may be interested just to know that word days is, 
is part Hebrew, part Aramaic. The very end of the book, of course, the book is written in both languages. The final word of the book, God says, hey, I want you to, the first part of it is in Hebrew, and the last part of it's in Aramaic. It's a strange word. Go your way, Daniel. Go your way. That's a line that does not come, well out, come out well in English. Oh, just carry on about business. But there's something intentional about it. It literally means continue in your steadfastness. Continue in your faithfulness, Daniel. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who maintain, who, can, who continue faithful. God's challenge to Daniel is, Daniel, continue to live your life with absolute faithfulness, resolute in your holiness. Stavanovich, up there at Walla Walla in his commentary, the brother of Ranko Stavanovich at Andrews, but his brother is an Old Testament scholar there at um, Walla Walla University. He wrote the commentary on the book of Daniel. He says, hey, look at this. The two concepts that Daniel's book emphasizes over and over and over are watchfulness and faithfulness. And the prophet is now exhorted in this verse 13 to cling to the two till the end. It's embedded in the verse. Not just go, continue on, Daniel. Do, do your life. But Daniel, stay absolutely faithful, Daniel. You will rest but I'll be back for you. A Jewish rabbi is said to have often repeated to his followers, his students, repent one day before you die. Inevitably, they would ask him, how do we know when we're going to die? To which the rabbi would reply, then you'd better repent every day. Every day, living with intentionality, with faithfulness. Not one thing. What, what a great controversy he said. To deliberately stifle one point of conviction. Go your way, Daniel. Go your way. That key line, continue in absolute steadfastness, in faithfulness, in watchfulness. Live every day of the rest of your life, Daniel, without one string over your parachute. Chris Hodges, I've shared his book with you before, The Daniel Dilemma. He says, yes, the very end of the book of Daniel, the standard gets, gets, gets high. He says, the standard got higher, but the grace gets deeper. Daniel was a man of influence. He lived a countercultural life. God used him to influence nations because of his faithfulness. So what happens next? The invitation. Go your way. Go your way, Michael. Go your way, beloved. What does that mean? It means with absolute steadfastness, with faithfulness, holding on to God, without one string over your parachute. Go your way. And in the end, you will have an inheritance. It's a promise of glory. It's a promise of heaven. And when we stand in our inheritance, prophets and kings, reflecting back on this chapter of Daniel chapter 12, says this, he, that is God, never leads them otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose that they are fulfilling. All that he brings upon them in test and in trial that they may be strong to do and to suffer for him. When we stand in our inheritance and Daniel is standing in his and we look back over our lives, we will not choose it any different. Bring it on. How does this thing end? How does it end? It ends with the prince, the great prince, stepping forward for his people, saying, they're mine. I've got them. They're all mine. Ah, it's a story. 
It's the story of Johnny Bravo. That was his call sign. His real name was Captain Mike Drowley. It's a year after, not quite a year, it's, it's August of 2002, almost a year after the attacks of September 11. The Taliban government had only recently fallen after taking a pounding from the U.S. forces for their refusal to turn over the Al-Qaeda leader, the infamous leader, Osama bin Laden. There were a lot of special operation forces in the area performing missions. And on this day of August 2002, there were 22 special op soldiers stuck in a valley. Johnny Bravo was in his A-10 aircraft flying circles around them. The A-10 is affectionately called the Warthog. It's an armored single seat. Not really a fighter jet, but a bit like one. Meant for low level engagement. Johnny Bravo, he's up in the night sky. The stars below him is a thick, thick layer of clouds. Below that, a valley where 22 of his skies are trapped. Johnny Bravo can't get into them. It's a narrow valley. He hears over the radio that they're receiving, that they're engaging, that they're the, they see the enemy. And then as he circles above them, he hears the three words that send shivers down any pilot's neck. Troops in contact. It meant that his men on the ground were in trouble. They were under attack and they were pinned down. He's circling August 16, 2002, wondering what can I do? It's, I can't see him. They can't see me. They're in a narrow little valley. How do, I, how do I help them? They didn't call for help. They knew he couldn't get to them. But he heard it in their voice that they needed help or they would die. The avionics in his plane in 2002 were not as advanced. He couldn't map out the terrain and know exactly what he was getting into. But Johnny Bravo sunk his A-10 warthog into that thick bank of clouds. Coming out underneath them, he found himself wedged between two mountains, and he said the night sky was lit up with enemy gunfire. Both sides coming at his 22 guys down below. He didn't have the computer ability to, to measure out how much distance he would have. So he counted off six seconds and pulled up. Six seconds, one 1,000, as he fired back on the enemy. One 1,000, two 1,000, six, and he pulled up. G-forces pressing his body against his seat. He broke back through the clouds into the starlit night sky. Circled around, praying the prayer. Please, let this work. As he broke back out into the night sky over the radio, he heard the hopeful words, good hits, good hits, keep them coming. Johnny Bravo circled around and a second time dove back down into that bank of clouds, coming out under a thousand feet above the ground. Enemy fire pouring back into the valley, him returning the fire. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. Pressing into the night valley, he pulled back up. Good hits came the cry. You did it again, good hits. Again and again, Johnny Bravo sunk his plane into what he could not see to protect his 22 men. And on August of 2002, that night, 22 American soldiers went home safe.
I wish I could tell you when. When it is that the prince, the great prince, steps up. I can't. I don't know. But I know in the thick of the battle, and our cries, God, is there, are you up there? That thick cloud covers the supernatural from the natural. But Daniel chapter 12 makes it cogent, makes it unequivocal that there's a great prince who will step forward and say, not my people. I'm not losing a single one of them. Not on my watch. I'd like to invite our worship team forward. We're going to sing this hymn one more time. It's a hymn of Daniel chapter 12. The great prince who watches over his people. He steps forward and says, not on my watch. I'm going to save every one of them. And beloved, God will not lose a single one of us as long as we're willing to follow the commission. But you, Daniel, go your way. Stay faithful. Don't let one string be over your parachute. Cut the cords if you have to. Be faithful. Be radically faithful. Be intensely faithful. Be faithful. God will not lose you, not on his watch. We're standing on the banks, the stormy banks of the Jordan River, looking across to our home, our inheritance. Will you go with me? make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look on you and give you peace that passes understanding until again we meet in worship. Amen. Amen.